objects have uncertainty that needs to be cut down by a factor of five, which means that we are not anywhere close to where we want to be to feel comfortable to have a comfortable sense of safety for our assets. And and moreover, operators are not really willing to pay a whole lot of money for information that will mostly remain unactionable with with the current uh, ephemeris. Hey, space watchers! This is Space Cafe Radio, your channel about trends, awesome events, and interesting people in the space sector. We have been silent for a bit as we are in a transformation phase at SpaceWatch.Global. But we are resume here our services for you with a bang. In this episode, I spoke with Mahat Naja, a young Pakistani that I met first in the Diverse Dozen Cohort 2022 virtually. He really flashed me with his thoughts on SSA and STM in a global context. So I invited Mahat to discuss his thoughts with me on our Space Cafe Radio Geopolitics. I'm Torsten, publisher of Spacewatch.Global. Lean back and enjoy this unique episode. Mahat, it's great to have you in our Space Cafe today. When we met first, that was virtually in 2022 at the AIAA Diverse Dozens Cohort, you were standing out with your essay and that was themed Applying a polycentric form of governance in the space environment. And yes, I'm reading it off because I couldn't memorize that. But you started with empathy and inclusion are buzzwords we hear while discussing space sustainable solutions. That's pretty brave. So now, 15 months later, tell us more about your thoughts. Thank you, Torsten. Honored to be here. And uh, yes, I started my essay with the two words empathy and inclusion. And right away, I call them buzzwords, which can be a thing that other people might not pick very easily. But the thing is, we have seen people talk about the sustainability of space and the use of words collaboration and data sharing, information sharing, mutual capacity building, and all of these cool things. But they are not happening. If we are mentioning these at all the platforms, then It seems like they're just the extensions of the above mentioned uh, buzzwords that is empathy and inclusion. And when we look at the actual practices that are currently in place between different types of stakeholders from their respective countries, our actions are nowhere close to matching empathy or inclusion, are they? I was just on a lookout for solutions that make sense in the dynamicity of the space environment. And polycentricity historically addresses the problem of a tragedy of the commons. And we indeed have the problem here in the space environment where it is the tragedy of the commons or it is on its way to become a tragedy. That's why we are here to stop. And if we talk about polycentricity real quick, I would just say that in polycentricity, we have a decentralized decision centers with overlapping jurisdictions and a certain level of autonomy while maintaining standard rules, uh, values and norms. And if you put these terms, these uh, social sciences terms in Uh, technical environment that there is in space, I think a lot of our conflicts uh, come to a point of resolution. That's quite a start, I would say. <laughs> I know from our previous conversations, you studied in Graz at the university and your either space debris office sponsored thesis was also created there. And that all happened then during the, the COVID time. So how did you get your research done in the days? So the, the program that I was part of, it's called Space Tech, and it is for working professionals in the space industry who want to get a taste of space systems engineering. And we pick one area that needs attention and build, we build a viable business case for that. So very luckily in my cohort, it was the ESA Space Debris Office and they wanted something entrepreneurial for what they were venturing in. And COVID totally affected the program because we were supposed to visit six different ESA centers, CNES, DLR, none of that happened. And we had to do all of it remotely, which did present its challenges. But at the end of the day, we were able to fulfill the outcomes or fulfill the objectives of the program and present a business case that was technically and commercially viable. But the methodology in all of that was to primarily interview stakeholders from different types, owner operators, governments, space agencies, private companies, startups, and ask them, what do you want when it comes to providing SSA or STM services? And that's where we heard that they want improvement in uncertainty mm. by a factor of fifth. 
So whatever they're getting from open source or the best data that is available to them, they want their services to be improved by a factor of five. But are they willing to pay for it? That's another story. It was fantastic to actually have that uh, market survey and analysis and truly understand the problems the different stakeholders are facing and are willing to Mm -hmm. uh, pay for. At the end of the day, it went really well. What do you mean with the accuracy by a factor of five? So how does that translate? Maybe you can help me a bit more to understand that. I'll try to explain it in in simple terms. Every space object has uh, an oval ellipsoid around it, which is called its covariance. And the covariance is in three axes. It's a long track, a cross track, and radial directions. We have a certain level of covariance in which we feel confident that we can continue safe operations when we do a conjunction analysis or collision avoidance. Because inside that ellipsoid, we don't know where the object is. So it can be anywhere inside that ellipsoid. And the bigger the ellipsoid is, the higher the probability of collision is. So the owner operators or stakeholders know their ellipsoids to be too big and they want their ellipsoids, their uncertainty covariance ellipsoids to be reduced by a factor of fifth, which improves the probability of collision many times. Mm -hmm. Thus, it saves money in not doing those maneuvers that were not needed with better uncertainty. Can you give us... For a normal satellite, and I'm not sure if you're talking about a geo or leo satellites, but if you talk about a satellite, whatever, three ton wingspan, 10 meters, something like that. So how big is this ellipsoid around that? So what do we have to imagine here? If you are just taking the nominal radiometric astrometric measurements from the ground-based sensors, normally the uncertainty is around two kilometers along its largest axis. So there is a ellipsoid whose uh, semi-major axis is, is around a kilometer or its end-to-end distance is two kilometers. So, so that's a big ellipsoid. Whenever we want to reduce the size of that ellipsoid, we have to take more frequent measurements from mm. diverse geographical locations so that the orbit becomes more accurate and its statistical orbit determination minimizes the residuals. That's a bit technical, but that's how the ellipsoid is reduced. Oh, that's what our audience love. So it's a technical nitty gritty details. And me as an engineer, what is your background? Maybe you can tell us more about what brought you into this very specific area. So my background, I was a cadet at the U.S. Air Force Academy, where I did my bachelor's in astronautical engineering, focusing on advanced astrodynamics. I also did uh, a second bachelor's in humanities because I just wanted to have a humanistic connection with the physical sciences. And then my master's, of course, is in space systems engineering. And uh, most of my work experience is in academic and government sectors. And a lot of my passion for it comes from just primarily teaching astrodynamics to final year students in Pakistan universities and trying to figure out how we can, how Pakistan or how developing countries can use telescopes or inexpensive sensors to become part of the global movement to make space sustainable. And I think apart, other sensors are expensive, especially radars, and they have a lot of other limitations as well. But any amateur astronomer who has been looking at deep space objects can literally use the same sensor and look at space debris, especially if he's in a location where he has good dark skies. So in Pakistan, after my undergraduate in Pakistan, I was volunteering with astronomical societies. And I learned the art of astronomy and then applied that in the platform or in the medium of the space, man-made space environment. From that, the master's thesis was a small set of design, which also had small telescopes integrated in it to look at the space debris. And that really increased my interest in optical sensors because now I want all the developing countries. In fact, I want the young professionals in every single country to induct their telescopes for space debris monitoring and use polycentricity to take their data from distributed centers and contribute it in a global system that helps owner operators and makes uh, space a safe and sustainable platform to continue to grow in. So you talked about Pakistan universities. You are based out of Pakistan, right? Yes. Talking about SSA or STM in, in our case, it's not what you typically connect with Pakistan. And from your background, it's very Western-oriented, very Western-educated. So it's great to see that you bring that over 
to your home country. Let me continue on, on the study you have done in Graz. So what are the takeaways from the operators you talk to? So the takeaway is ephemeris. Most operators have their own unique algorithmic approaches when it comes to collision or collision avoidance. And that's why we have uh, a level of uh, disagreement when two operators from different stakeholders or two agencies or one agency and a private company in some other com uh, country, they, they have a potential conjunction, but they have disagreement on the level of uncertainty that they can agree upon. So the Iridium Cosmos collision of 2009 was there in the list of possible conjunctions for that day. But the covariance realism or the manifestation of that uncertainty amongst the users from the individual stakeholders was not realistic enough or pragmatic enough to conduct a maneuver and save ourselves from creating thousands of pieces of debris. The takeaway is we have we got to do a lot of work in a sense that we have to come up with more procedures, more processes, and improve their accuracy to a level where the stakeholders are willing to pay for it. Because if no one is willing to pay for space traffic services, then we essentially don't really have a service. We have to cover a few gaps from commercial viability, technical viability, and a level of mutual understanding, which is also called overlapping jurisdiction in polycentricity so that there is some sense of harmony among all the different types of stakeholders and they can arrange their assets or maneuver their assets in a harmonious way. I'm a bit shocked, to be very honest to you, about these ellipses and the sphere that we don't know where the satellite is actually when it moves. And that also question for me, all these conjunctions warning that I get today, if I have an whatever 100 kilo satellite, With this huge ellipsoid, there's a lot of air or not a lot of space in this case around that. So how can I maneuver? Because at the end of the day, I fly blind. Would you agree on that? To some extent, yes. And uh, you also have to, space is, is really vast because it's 3D, it, the celestial sphere is increasing in every single orbit. You essentially have a new orbit after every 50 meters because you can essentially put an object within a distance of 50 or 100 meters or one kilometer. But as soon as you realize that there is a potential conjunction, you start intentional measurements of those objects. So automatically, the ellipsoids start decreasing and they become more real and you're not as blind as you perceive because for potential conjunctions, the, the attention goes towards those objects And whichever sensor network is being used for that particular agency, it can be SSN, it can be EU SST, it can be IZON, APSCO, or any other specialized networks. They get into action. They put the priority of tasking those particular sensors where the object is going from to take more accurate measurements of those objects. And even I'm not even considering space-based sensors, so Sapphire or other space-based SSC sensors can also take measurements and they, they bring that uncertainty to a few meters. And this, I must say that this uncertainty is only for the objects that I don't have a control over. For my personal object, since I do have other communication and GPS sensors, I have way better accuracy of where my object is, but not about other people's objects. Okay, as long as I share this data as well. Yes, that's what we need to do. <laughs> of course, <yeah. laughs> because it's nice that I know where, where my satellite is. It's the same when I'm driving in Berlin. I'm always pretend that I'm the best driver in town because they see me. <laughs> But okay, that's a different story. Let's jump fast forward to now. So what happened after the diverse dozen for you? That's now 15 months ago. Any further exposure to you and these topics? To be honest, the first time we met in person at International Astronautical Congress. That's right. That was a phenomenal event for me. It was my first space conference in person. I was participating as an emerging space leader winner from Pakistan. And I was really able to talk to a lot of people about all these ideas because I was presenting two papers. One was about standardizing the observatory development process and how crowdsourcing can be done for all the telescopes that are out there with all the people and can be used for space debris measurements. But at the same time, I met some people from Secure World Foundation and shared my ideas with them. And over the course of the next few months, we kept on talking about how the participation from emerging space countries can be increased to make a safe and sustainable space. Because I say this thing that there is no regional or there is no country-specific STM solution or sustainable space solution. 
there is only one solution. It has to be global. It has to have all the stakeholders be part of it in a positive manner. So all those things were happening and those discussions were materialized in the form of a policy panel at Amos Tech Conference in Maui, Hawaii. And we were able to create a really impactful discussion on the evolution of commercial SSA data market, which directly connects with all the countries and all their sensors. Because if anyone in any remote location can take good quality astrometric measurements of space objects, they can essentially just sell that data and be part of a market if the market is already there. Emerging space countries can use their diverse geographic locations to contribute towards sustainable space data economy. And I think that's a really good way to start because it's doable. It doesn't need a lot of money to build up. A lot of equipment for this market already exists there. There are great companies who are producing amazing astronomical equipment that is readily integratable and people can build their observatories in a matter of hours now. So I think especially the young professionals and students in universities should use their observatories to take data and find frameworks or develop those frameworks where they can contribute or send their data in a fast manner to owner operators or people who have interest in that data. Because time is of real, real importance here. For a low Earth orbit object, you have the measurement you have taken hour and a half later, it has no importance because it's in the new orbit now. So it's difficult to improve the orbit that has already taken place in the past. Evolution of SSA data market has the potential to include emerging space countries and include maximum number of stakeholders in, in the race to make space a sustainable environment. I know there are ongoing debates about the professional data by radars, by top-level telescopes and the amateur arena you just mentioned that every student or every professional, every interested person with his own telescope can provide or input their own data to the source. So if I'm buying for a few thousand dollars in telescope and, and connect it to a network and provide my data, how relevant is that? That's where the part of polycentricity comes in when we talk about the standardization of rules, values, and norms. Mm -hmm. I think we need to bring standards for people who can readily take the data from their telescopes. I actually wrote a paper on it in which I mentioned some of the factors or parameters that can contribute towards standardization of data from optical sensors, amateur mm -hmm. optical sensors. And it depends on your geographical location, what your latitude and longitude is. It depends on the portal quality of the night sky that you are taking observations in. It depends on the accuracy of your mount and the quality of your optics. The quality and the pixels, the amount of pixels your CCD or CMOS chip has. And all of it combines into the form of a raw image or an astrometric image. And I still need to figure out or uh, the ast astronomy community can greatly help in coming up with uh, a set of standards that tells you that above this threshold, the signals to noise ratio of an image is actually good enough to be included in space traffic operations. And below this threshold, the signals to noise ratio of a particular image is not good enough. And then all these factors are playing a part in signals to noise ratio, your equipment, your location, your even if you are located in an area where there is more seismic activity, there are more vibrations, all of this is going to contribute towards the final mm. image. I think it's a really good area for people to look into to come up with standards because if the astronomers, astronomy community is integrated into this thing, that will exponentially increase the number of sensors that we have for space traffic management and it will be a game changer, I believe. As this Space Cafe Radio is part of our geopolitics series, so what are the space debris issues that the global community is facing? And I, I think there's an awareness of that, but what has to be solved? So maybe you can guide us. It's a really interesting question because all of space debris, it's not organic. It didn't come mm. from space. We created it. We created it by intentional anti-satellite kinetic experiments because we wanted as a country to make a statement that, hey, world, listen, we have this capability, don't mess with us. There was no need for that. Just to be honest here, Pakistan did not contribute with an ASA test. No, we did not. 
I think this is US, China, Russia, and India. So there are four countries have done it. No, all of these countries are going on a commercial track. So now they have made a statement about their capability, but now they want to use a platform for economic and commercial purposes, which is good. But how does that incentivize the other countries for not making that statement or for not using the clause of national security in the space domain for their own own purposes? We have a lot of other countries that have the capability to, Iran can do so, North Korea, Israel, other countries can make a statement that we have the capability to destabilize your space-based senses. So I think I'll come back to the where we started from. Empathy also means acceptance of your wrongdoings. So this is going to rile people up. But in Western media or a lot of the Western hemisphere, you will always have these talks about the debris that has been created by Feng Yun-1C or by the Russian test or by the Chinese ASAT test. But there will be no discussion of the tests that were conducted by the US. And similarly, if you go talk to the Russians or the Chinese, they have reservations that, oh, they have done this as well. So why is all the blame being given to us? And that's where I believe that if American and Russian astronauts and cosmonauts respectively can live in international space station, even right after the Cold War, I think there is a pragmatic possibility of us human beings coming to one table and talking about, hey, we did this wrong, you did this wrong, this is a limited resource and we have to think about the future generations and its future potential to create positive change. Because as much of a positive change space can create, it can equally create negative change as well. If we perceive a future space environment on the likes of land, sea, and air domains full of conflicts, full of pollution, full of unsustainability. Mm -hmm. And of course, the emerging and developing countries will face the consequences of an unsustainable space before the developed countries would face. Because at that point in time in future, the developed countries would already have mechanisms in place that either can maneuver their objects, have autonomy in their objects, or physically stop debris from hitting their objects. But the developing countries would not have that kind of technology readiness level. Their objects would just hit and, and be destroyed and gone. Empathy and inclusion means that we have to sit together. We have to say, yes, I messed up. I shouldn't have done that. Let's change our behaviors in the space domain even if we choose to remain angry on land, that's okay, but let's change that in, in the space domain and we need cooperation. Because let's be real, there is no solution. Even if one country has 5,000 sensors all across the world, it's going to take two or three small countries or small satellites to just create a collision and, and create debris. And that can be, as we have seen from the geopolitical context in these days about what resistance means and, and, and all of those things, it does mean that we need to give equity and intersectionality to the space domain from all users so that we keep it sustainable and beneficial for all. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Moving is right up there with death and divorce in the Stress Olympics. But fear not. Turn that box of woes into a crate of woes with moving tips in the Life Beyond Boxes podcast with Premium Q Moving. Dive into the world of hassle-free moves, learn tips and tricks to save on cash and your sanity. Say goodbye to those moving meltdowns and hello to the smooth sailings. Or should we say smooth movings? Tune into Life Beyond Boxes with Premium Q Moving on lifebeyondboxes.com or find us on your favorite podcast platform. And with us, unpack the secrets to a stress-free move. I mean, talking about the geopolitical dimension here, again, I would like to emphasize on your own situation. You're a Pakistani, you studied at the Air Force Academy in the US, you're pursuing your PhD in the US, and your country has cl very close ties to China. How difficult can it be? But how does that foster or hinder your research and your work? Because what you're talking here about is geopolitics per se. Personally, I have always maintained and will continue to maintain an academic and humanistic approach towards my research in creating space as a medium in which we don't repeat our patterns of spreading pollution like humankind did in land, air, and sea domains. That being said, I believe the first and foremost countries, just like America, China, Russia, Europe, they, they need to create an open channel of communication and cooperation in favor of their respective objects. Because as soon as they do that, the smaller countries will automatically do, do that because they would love to be included in the discussions for safe and effective space traffic coordination. 
in an ideal world, um, all the space faring powers should have a streamlined way of uh, sensor sharing, sensor fusion, data sharing, and information sharing to give rise to a global system of systems to optimize measurements of space objects and to yield better ellipsoids, metal covariants, so that we all enjoy a safe and sustainable space. To keep space sustainable, this is the only way forward. There is no other way of keeping a space sustainable from a country or a regional perspective. It has to be global. It has to include the, all the stakeholders, especially all the government agencies, because once all the government agencies are included, they have some leeway or leverage on their own respective private sectors. So if we want to continue our patrons and have a polarized space traffic management system of systems, there is a Western system and there is a Asian system and then there's other small networks. I don't think it's going to be a lot of fun for any of them. Before we come to the call to action question that I have our spare to the last, can you help me to understand how compatible are the data sets that are taken by the sensors, how they can be fused and how open are these data sharing agreements globally at the moment? Do we have an overview? And to top that, how does the commercial SSA data come into that as well? Right off the bat, when we talk about radar sensors, the best thing about them is the range and range rate, which means how far the object is and how the object's rate is changing. When we talk about optical sensors, we have uh, azimuth and elevation, or in other words, right ascension and declination. And we take for optical sensors, we have to take multiple measurements to have the process of triangulation and to create a state vector, which needs three elements in the positional axis and three in the velocity axis. But if you combine a radar and a telescope together, the right ascension and declination measurements of a telescope are actually better than the azimuth and elevation measurements that a radar gives you. When we talk about data fusion, in sensor fusion in its most raw format, we have telescopes and radars acting together to give us the best of both worlds. Then once we have information, for example, it all gives us a point in that orbit where the statistical orbit determination tells us that it is among these areas. But once we have a state vector and we are using a particular statistical orbit determination method, different type of sensors can give raw data to continue the process of iteration until we minimize the residuals to match our simulated orbit to our actual orbit. So mm -hmm. that's the data fusion that's happening in orbit determination. And then when we talk about information fusion, you take one orbit information from one object and you take multiple information of multiple objects from multiple different agencies and create a global space picture. So that's information fusion. So you, you see we have different levels of fusing either the sensors or the raw data or even process data, and then even the most actionable information can be used at all the different levels. So I think when two agencies or two countries, they decide to do that, they can do it at any of these levels. Sometimes it's better to just do it at the earliest level to minimize the time delay so that raw measurements are brought to one central processing facility right away so that the orbit accuracy can be known at as soon as possible after the measurement is taken so that actionable information can be given to the owner operator if they need to maneuver or so on and so forth. What you're saying is that fusing Chinese, Russian, Indian, American, European data into one is not a big thing. It's technical possible. Is that right? Yeah, it's, it's definitely technically possible. Maybe not at the most low level uh, fusion in the form of raw data. But definitely it's possible in the form of ephemeris or let's say two-line elements. So if the sensor networks of all these different countries are generating two-line elements, which is the method that globally is being globally used, they can literally mm -hmm. just contribute their two-line elements. And you can actually have multiple sets of two-line two -line elements of one object and crunch them using orbit determination algorithms and have the best orbit of a particular object from all these different types of sensors it is definitely going to improve our uncertainty by leaps and bounds. If by mirac some miracle, we start to, to do that. Thank you very much for clarifying on that. So last point, last question. As we are an independent voice for space, so what are the action items, the calls to action that you see in the near future 
and maybe midterm to be started or even to be solved? You've been very vocal before, but what are the, if we break them down? I think that the world needs to accept that when we use the word of national security, spacefaring powers can deviate from ideal or preferred behavior. In a multipolar world, the stance of national security can be taken by any polarity. Hence, it is a common man and the developing countries that face the consequences of a hyped up security environment. Mm -hmm. By already having a polarity in space exploration goals, we are creating a divide in this world, which at the end just hurts the space environment. I also believe that space is a limited resource and must be treated as such. If we talk about democratizing space or making it equitable for all, maybe we need to allocate orbital slots based on world population. Maybe we need to see that this country gets these many slots because they have this proportional population in the world. And that's how we can have a democratic allocation of orbital slots as per the population. But then obviously countries with less population but more economic resources would need to build partnerships with countries with more population but less economic resources. And I think that's great because that helps the economy reach a level of balance, not only on Earth, but also in space as well. And that makes us think that all the objects that we're pumping into space for commercial gains, is it really worth it to put those objects in space? Is it a sustainable behavior? Is it going to come back and hurt us in the future? That's we talk, Democratizing space is, is used very often, but it's also a buzzword because it's not happening at all. And I think the, the main lesson here is that let's, let's start putting more humanistic approach in our commercial and security ventures and see if it is really sustainable for the future generations. Great uh, food for thought, in my opinion. Thank you very much for that. That's interesting to see how that approach might work out on a global level. But I know that the UN OSA is very active now with their new director, with RT Holomany on those topics and tries to bring that to a new development speed or a new speed of actionable items. Mahat, thank you very much for your time. It was a great pleasure to have you in our show. And I'm looking forward to hear from you much more. And maybe if you like, we're happy to share the links to your documents in our show notes. Yes, please do. All the links that I shared with you about my previous talks. And it was my honor to be here. And it's my journey to continue this message, not only from a social sciences perspective, but also to pursue it from a technical perspective during my PhD. So I'm all in. Thank you very much. Thank you, Torsten. If you have further questions, reach out to us at radio at spacewatch.global. If you like these or other episodes of Space Cafe Radio, leave us a rating on your preferred podcast platform. It is the currency of today. And if you want to stay on the pulse of the space industry, please visit our website at www.spacewatch.global and subscribe to our newsletters. And of course, don't forget to become a Space Watcher. I'm Torsten Kreening, publisher at spacewatch.global, your independent perspective on space. Thank you.